Right, let's, uh, let's make a start in. Uh, so we're just saying there that this is a, a well-scheduled talk because uh, we've had the talk on generative AI and now uh, as a recovery, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have the, the talk on imposter syndrome and uh, a topic that's very dear to my heart because lots of people say, Garth, you're a developer advocate now. Yes, I am. Do you ever do any real work? You know, it's like, so, um, <laughs> so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Paddy from Gearset talking about imposter syndrome. Good morning, NIDC. Uh, my name is Patrick Boyd. I'm a software engineer at Gearset. And I'm going to talk this morning about imposter syndrome, or as I've come to somewhat think of it, uh, a day in the life as a programmer. Um, I'd start this by saying that I don't feel qualified to give this talk in any way. <laughs> uh, and that's one of the main reasons why I thought I should give it. So today I'm going to talk a wee bit about what imposter syndrome is. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about my own recent experiences with imposter syndrome, uh, and then a wee bit of a chat about why it's maybe so prevalent amongst programmers uh, in particular, and what we can maybe do to help ourselves, and then at the end, maybe why it's not all bad. So, um, first off, what is imposter syndrome? So I went out to do a wee bit of research about this and kind of assumed that I would go out and find a fairly well-defined idea of what imposter syndrome is, and as it turns out, there's a million different definitions, but I kind of filtered through them and got down to these two main ones. The first one there, a persistent feeling of self-doubt that can make you doubt your own ability to do your job. That's kind of what I expected to find. That's my own sort of experience with imposter syndrome. But as I looked around, the, this one at the, one at the bottom, uh, an inability to recognize that success has been achieved through your own efforts. Now, how do we think about that? And I reckon, I reckon I know people for whom that definition is probably a more accurate idea of what imposter syndrome is. So, uh, no pressure. There's a little bit of audience participation here. Before we move on, and don't feel obliged, can we make a wee quick show of hands, although I can barely see you all, to be honest. Uh, people in the room, we reckon they've encountered imposter syndrome in their day-to-day -day work. Yep, <laughs> that looks about right. So there was a recent survey by a company called Blint, or Blind, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, and they reckon that 58% of employees in the tech sector have encountered imposter syndrome in the workplace. Um, and actually, when they went and had a look at some of the really big players like Twitter and Google and Apple, that number went up rather than down. Uh, and if any data scientists out there, they'll be able to look at this 58% figure, have a think about it and tell us that's a big number. It's a lot of people, you know? So. A little bit about me. Um, I am almost 20 years a developer. Uh, I did a few things before that. Uh, I'm not a computer science background, I'm a mechanical engineering background. Uh, and I'm currently working as a principal software engineer at Gearset uh, for the last three months. Uh, and the previous 14 years, uh, I worked for uh, Hub Digital Solutions uh, in the FinTech sector. Now, uh, 14 years, fairly long tenure these days. Uh, and uh, moving on has, you know, uh, unearthed a few imposter syndrome symptoms as I've been uh, uh, working through the last few months. So I was in my comfort zone uh, and in the, in the Gen AI theme that seems to be in a lot of the talks these days, my imagery was generated by Mid Journey just because, why not? Um, in my comfort zone, 14 years, I was there a long time. Uh, I knew the code base really well, all the little dark corners, all the scary bits of the code base. I probably wrote quite a lot of them. Um, and also I had a pretty good idea of the domain knowledge. You know, I'd worked a lot with the business analysts and the, the people within the business. So uh, I felt I had a good knowledge of what the business did as well, not just the software side, and could answer questions when put to me. And also uh, a lot of my colleagues had long tenure there as well, and I knew them and trusted them and hopefully they trusted me. So it was a very comfortable place to work. Uh, some of my colleagues are here as well and have promised to heckle me if this all goes sideways. So uh, if you hear shouting, it's, uh, it's gone bad. So I decided after 14 years, what I really needed was a new challenge. You know, I wanted to stretch myself a wee bit, but be careful what you wish for. What I hadn't really thought through when I went looking for a new challenge is that if you go looking for a challenge, You've got to expect to be challenged at some point. Uh, so I moved to uh, a new role with Gearset, starting as a principal software engineer. 
Now, I had a relatively long notice period to work out uh, and a quite a long run into starting at Gearset. And the, the principal part of that software engineer started to weigh a wee bit heavy on me as I was coming up. I felt there'd be an expectation to go in and probably deliver early on. Uh, and I started and it was a familiar in some ways, but a relatively unfamiliar tech stack libraries uh, and frameworks and tools that I haven't used before. Uh, it was also quite a lot of front-end work, which I haven't done for a few years. I've been mostly back-end for a while, so my JavaScript was a wee bit stuck in five years ago. Uh, so it's just a wee bit behind the curve. Uh, and I was on a Mac, well, in a Windows machine, which I haven't used for a very long time. And as it turns out, I have a lot of muscle memory attached to hitting the control key uh, that has taken quite some unwinding to do. Plus, I have a whole new set of colleagues that I don't know. Uh, and just in from the first day, they all seem really smart. So I'm a little bit out of my depth, and I'm not really used to being out of my depth. So we cut forward a, you know, a few days towards the end of the, the first week, uh, and my colleagues who seemed quite smart at the start, it's changed a wee bit. They're definitely smart. <laughs> this team knows their onions and they know what they're at. Uh, and I'm sitting there and imposter syndrome was tapping me on the shoulder and going, can you actually do this? So I find I'm hanging back a wee bit. Uh, people who've worked with me before would maybe testify that I'm not too backwards and coming forward in code reviews or meetings, but I'm holding back just because I'm not entirely sure what I'm talking about. Uh, and it's really this weight of my own expectation to deliver. If I step back now, a few weeks on, feeling much happier about it, I can look at this and go, this is objectively ridiculous. I've 20 years experience. I do know what I'm doing and I will pick it up, but in the moment, when you don't quite know the answer to a question that's posed to you, it's very difficult sometimes to get out of it. Now, I need to take a moment here and just say, because our recruiter, Connor, is in the hall in there, and if he thinks I've stood here in front of 100 developers at NIDC and told them that Gearset's a really hard place to come and start to work, his head might explode, and we don't really want that. It's not the company. The company's been really good. The onboarding's been good. They've been very clear in their expectations of me, and also in the feedback of how I've been doing. This is my expectations for myself. It's what I think I should be capable of doing, and I'm comparing it to I worked for 14 years in the same place. You ask me to do something, I know where to go and I know how to do it to a totally new place where I don't have all the answers, but I still have that expectation for myself. So why do we do this to ourselves? Yeah. Because it is an us problem, you know? It's, uh, it's in our heads, you know? So I spent a wee bit of time reading about imposter syndrome uh, and just to try and find why it seems to be so prevalent amongst programmers. Uh, and I have a few sort of main reasons that I think this maybe applies. So the first one is benchmarking. We all love a bit of benchmarking, you know, running your software, seeing which one's faster. But in this case, it's benchmarking ourselves against our colleagues and against people we see online. Uh, and this can be very tricky. We work in a high skill industry. In order to get to where you're sitting in your job, you have had to qualify uh, as a software engineer and you've had to get over whatever hurdles, technical interview hurdles there are to get into your company. So has everybody else that you work with. So you know that you're in a room full of people who do know what they're doing. Um, and also everything constantly changes, you know, uh, especially if you work on the JavaScript front end thing that seems to change week to week, uh, what the best practice is, what the best framework is to use. It's very hard to keep up with the bleeding edge. Um, and this expectation that we should be able to pick up new technologies in short time and then, you know, utilize them as if we have a sort of expertise. It's not really reasonable and uh, it's tricky. Also, programming, we're all here developers or programmers, we just work in the tech industry, but a programmer covers such a broad swathe of disciplines. You have data scientists, you've got DBAs, front-end developers, back-end developers, and each one of those is really a different discipline with its own deep level of expertise. You can't reasonably switch between one to the other and expect to just run with it, you know? Uh, and also there's no one right way. You can code something one way and a colleague or an article, you read an article and then you go, oh no, you should absolutely be doing it this way. Uh, and it's very easy for these things to get on top of you. You go, ah, oh, I didn't do that right. There isn't a right way, you know, it either works or it doesn't work. 
uh, ultimately. Uh, and uh, it's very easy for these things to just get on top of us a wee bit. Uh, I'm not going to benchmark my graph drawing skills. A bit shonky, but... Uh, so you've got to be careful who you compare yourself to. This strapping gentleman here, Sam Warburton, former captain of the Welsh rugby team, multiply capped British and Irish Lion, man on top of his game. At age 16, he played rugby and he also played football. Uh, and obviously he went down the rugby path and it's worked out all right for him, but uh, it's never really, I went looking to see if this would actually happen, but there's no corroboration of it. But when he played football at school, there was a kid in his year at school that used to run rings around everybody else and I often wonder if the fact he went down the rugby path rather than the football path was because the kid at his school who he was playing football against was this guy, Gareth Bale. Sometimes you could maybe refer to him as the, uh, the George Best of Wales. Uh, very talented footballer. And this is the thing, you never really know in the moment who it is you are comparing yourself to. You know, In your office, you might be looking at somebody in the corner banging out PRs. They might turn out in a year's time, they've set up a new multi-million pound business on their way. The only person that's really important to compare yourself to is yourself and to make sure you're happy with how you're getting on and how you're improving compared to how you were last week. We're also fiends for setting ourselves uh, unrealistic expectations. You know, there is so much to learn in any given subject or discipline, you know. Um, and there's a real depth of knowledge needed in order to be able to apply these things properly. You know, it's very easy to learn the basics of something. But to get to a point where you feel you have uh, expertise is tricky. It takes time and it takes you actually using the code, you know. Uh, I've gone into a new job doing a lot of front end stuff. I have done four or five training courses over the last couple of years, modern JavaScript, React libraries, and I've never actually used it in anger. So when you do come to it, it's like, I have learned it all and I've learned it all, but I've never actually applied it. And once you start to apply it and really dig into it, this is when it sticks, when you learn the expertise and the little foibles of things that, you know, aren't really covered in the training. It's like you start to, to pick out the bits you really need to know. The other thing is that every day is different. You know, you're going to go in some days and you're going to be on fire. You're going to bang out three or four PRs. Everything's going to be great. You're going to go in another day. Maybe you're a bit tired. Maybe stuff's happening in your home life and you're only running at like 50 or 60% of your, your max. You know, if you go in that day and you hit 60%, you shouldn't be down on yourself. You know, it's because you've hit as much as you could possibly do that day. You've done 100% of 60%. And it's important to just give yourself a bit of a break. You can't run at the same level all the time. There will be ups and downs. Thing is, you don't have to understand everything. This little snippet of code here on the right, I didn't write, I don't understand, it's a bit of Perl. If you run it, uh, it will print out uh, just another Unix Perl hacker, one character at a time in the console. Totally useless, but you'll often find yourself in a situation where you read an article or there's somebody you work with and they've developed their whole back end in Perl for speed. And then they've used uh, Mandangular, the new JavaScript framework. You're not using Mandangular, you're still on Next.js. Oh, you should use Mandangular. It's uh, React and Angular mashed together, but you know, it uses ChatGPT in the back end to dynamically create the front end and blah, 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 blah. You don't need to do everything what you need to learn and what you need to understand are the things that are in front of you right now, the things that are important for your job, you know. Uh, don't try and learn everything. Learn the right things. And finally, in this sort of list of things that sort of feed into our imposter syndrome is taking credit for stuff. I don't think as developers we are particularly good at it. Uh, I don't think people from Northern Ireland are particularly good at it in general. My own personal way of taking Positive feedback is to go, thank you very much, and then sort of curl away, you know, we should get better at this. It's good to take that credit and take it on board and appreciate it for what it is. Um, I feel, and this is when people say, people often do, it usually means just themselves, but certainly I do, tend to dwell on my mistakes longer than I probably should. Quite often in the middle of the night when I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe it did that. The thing about this is, while you're dwelling on your mistakes, the people you work with the people who you were there when you made the mistake, I'm pretty much guaranteed they're not dwelling on your mistake. They probably don't even remember and have moved on, you know? It's good to let these things go. Um, I like to think of Baz Luhrmann at this point and the uh, Wear Sunscreen song, you know? Uh, 
remember the compliments you're given and forget the insults. And if you can figure out how to do this, please let me know. Yeah. But it's important to try, you know? And also, we work in teams. And in every team, someone might be a bit louder, someone might be working at a slightly higher rate. But it's important to remember that every contribution to a team makes a difference to the team's delivery. You might feel like you're not really contributing, but without what you've done and what your input to that team is, would the feature be shipped? No, probably wouldn't. Every contribution matters, and it's important just to bear that in mind. So, imposter syndrome, it's hard. We all deal with it, but is it all bad? Uh, the answer is, for a lot of people, probably not. You may well have come across the Dunning-Kruger effect before. And it states that the least competent in a certain subject tend to overestimate their ability. Really quite interesting. They also say, some researchers, that the most competent people in a subject area tend to underestimate their ability. And I think, I like to think of this as the, uh, the valley of imposter syndrome, you know? So uh, I went to a workshop yesterday and the workshop said, it's gonna be a bit in Python, don't do Python. I haven't really ever coded in Python. So I spent an hour, rattled through a Python tutorial and I was like, oh, I could probably cope writing some Python if I had to. So I'm, I'm here, I'm at the top of this curve. You know, it's not that hard, but if someone sat down and asked me to write an application in Python and you start to look at, oh, well, how do I deploy this? And how do I configure it? And how do we test it? And what's NumPy? And where, why do I put this on PyPy? And all these other considerations that come into writing a professional bit of software. And you find yourself quite quickly down at the bottom of this curve where you've suddenly figured out all the things that you don't know. Uh, and it's a lot. And you can, it can be a bit sort of paralyzing at that point where you go, I need to do something, but there's so much to think about and I don't know how to do all these things yet. And then you sort of slowly climb out and you get to the point where you go, I have a fairly competent level of expertise in this, but you tend not to estimate yourself as confident as you did at the very start because you know how much there is to it now, you know? So while imposter syndrome is hard in the moment, it's just part of this sort of learning curve almost, you know? It's telling you, you're not at the very start where you're too overconfident, but you've got a ways to go to get to where you want to be, you know? Really, it's kind of, it's a push for you to improve. It's you noticing that I'm not quite happy with my level of competence and it's, a, it's your brain sort of pushing you on like, well, let's do something about it, you know? It's probably a healthy self-awareness. Uh, and like I just said, and I don't want to go too Rumsfeld and everybody, but you know what you don't know, which is really important. So for most people, it'll get better, you know? Uh, for me, I have 20 years experience. I've had some very supportive, colleagues and managers over the years who've given me nice bits of feedback and I have that to fall back on uh, when I'm feeling like oh I'm a little bit uncertain and I don't know what to do I can fall back on length of career and experience but uh, when uh, NIDC were looking for people to speak I thought maybe it's worth getting up and having a, a talk about this because I do have 20 years of experience, but if you're newer to the industry, or maybe you haven't had the sort of support that I have had, or maybe you have the opposite of that than a manager and a colleague, maybe it's worth hearing that other people have these problems too. And actually, I've given this talk as a practice session and talked to a few people about it, and I've already had two people come up to me and say, I never realized that senior people have the same problem that I'm having right now. And I was like, Bloody hell, I didn't realize we were hiding it that well. Maybe we only talk about it at the super secret tech leads meeting that we have once a month in the Garrick, you know. Um, we should get better at uh, talking that out, you know. So while it, for most people it gets better, that's not the case for everybody. Some people can find this gets on top of them a wee bit because it's this fear of being found out. Find out when you're sitting at work, you've got something to do and you're looking at the screen and you go, I don't know how to do this. And it can be this sort of loss of confidence People tend to contribute less, you know, in code reviews or in meetings, they're less likely to step up and uh, voice their opinion because they're not sure about it. And also, and this is the kicker, you tend to make more mistakes because you're worried about what you're doing. It becomes a bit of a vicious circle, like this guy, and is, uh, is chomping on the ghosts. But what can you do? Uh, so this is the thing, we can do stuff to help ourselves. It sounds really obvious, but set a training plan. You don't know what to do, let's learn how to do it. But it's not just the learning how to do it, it's almost just 
setting yourself a plan to say, I am in the middle of learning how to do it. Maybe it's a wee timetable you do, you know, colored charts, that's never worked for me. I spent more time making the bloody timetable in school and actually revising sometimes. But now I find, because my free time is a bit fluid, I do a tutorial, I get to a point where I'm too tired to read more in the night and I email myself a link to where I was and the next time I have a bit of free time, I pick up the email and carry on from there. You gotta find a way it works for you and just keep it rolling along, you know. The more you learn, the happier you're gonna feel. Talk to your seniors, talk to your colleagues. You know, you may well find other people are in the same boat, particularly if as a company you've moved to a new framework. You know, you may well find that everybody else is finding it a bit difficult and actually just to sit down in a room with uh, colleagues and just work through a tutorial, maybe hack together something really simple, might just help everybody. You might find by asking that question, you'll be helping others as well. Now, I wrote this one and I hummed and hard about whether this is the right phrasing for it, but own your mistakes. I couldn't find a more concise way to put it. And it's not like own your mistakes, they're your mistakes. It's about, you shouldn't be afraid, hopefully in your company and in your life to go, I made a mistake there, I'd like to fix it. Or I was wrong about that. Or another hard one is, I don't know yet how to do that. Um, my very first job as a mechanical engineer, not a software engineer, uh, on the first day, my manager said to me, if you make a mistake, come and tell me about it. Uh, if you don't tell me about it, I'm gonna find it later and it's bad, that's much harder to deal with. But if you find you've made a mistake, come and tell me and we'll deal with it. And that was really handy when I nearly blew up half the factory and put an extended stop on the production line. First thing I did was mess up here and we sorted it out and it really wasn't that bad. Um, but it could have been if, if I'd looked at it and gone, oh, I can't, can't mention this, it could have been really bad, you know? So it's important to be able to say, own your mistakes and do something about it, you know? And the other one is, you've got to celebrate your wins as well. You know, if you do something well, you know, take the page speed down by 20% or you're getting 20% more clicks in this button, brilliant, stick it on Slack, stick it on Teams. Like, look what we did, team did this. Thanks very much to Bob and Diane for all their input, you know? Uh, keep these things moving. And as a company, uh, it's important to probably try and cultivate this culture of learning, you know? And to think that learning at work isn't wasted time. It doesn't matter what you're learning, it's time invested. Um, you need to try and be better at giving and receiving positive feedback. And that's not just in the formal performance review thing, it's just a day to day. If you're doing a code review and you see something you like, just leave a note, go, that's brilliant. Or, you know, someone ships a feature and you use it, and like, that's really clever, I like that. Just see those little bits, those little bits of positive feedback, you may find that really helps someone when they're feeling a wee bit uncertain. Try and avoid the blame game. Um, very common in some places. It's not super helpful, you know, people will make mistakes. Um, and, and just look out for each other, you know. It's, uh, I don't know if anybody was in the empathy and development talk just there. It's the same sort of thing, you know, it's a, uh, be kind to yourself, be kind to the people around you, you know? Um, and as seniors, so the, the first slide about what you can do for yourself is a wee bit sort of a fake it till you make it, you know? Um, unless you're doing nuclear fusion control software, then please don't. But uh, as seniors, I think we should maybe do a wee bit less of fake it if you, until you make it because it's very easy to do, you know? Uh, and you, the more experience you have, the quicker you're going to learn, but you may well find that if you have juniors in your team or people coming in, they'll probably appreciate more you saying, listen, I'm not quite sure how to do this. Let's take half an hour and we'll go and figure it out rather than sitting down and going, right, I want to code this and I'm going to have a tutorial up on Stack Overflow on the other screen and we'll just sort it out, you know? Uh, probably worth us all trying to be a bit louder about that, you know? So I said at the start, I'm not qualified to give this talk. I'm not qualified to give this talk. I'm a loud mouth, slightly opinionated developer. I'm not a mental health professional. If you're in a position where this is really getting on top of you, please talk to somebody, talk to a colleague, talk to a friend, or reach out, talk to a professional. There's plenty of them out there. You don't even have to leave the house these days, uh, but try not to let it get on top of you. So you might think at this point, here's a man, he's just written a, a talk and given a presentation about imposter syndrome. He's gonna be on top of it. He's gonna be looking out for all these signs. He's gonna be minding himself and generally doing all he can to stop it. No, 
you'd be completely wrong. While writing this presentation about imposter syndrome, about halfway through, I started to see the other titles coming through for the NIDC talks. And I was like, ooh, they sound interesting. Using AI to you know, refactor the code base, you know, and all the clever little taglines, like, they're brilliant, mine is shit. I, was like, I had one of the biggest bouts of imposter syndrome I've had for a long time. I was like, I can't stand up in front of a room of people and talk about this. I don't know what I'm talking about. And I had to really sit myself down and give myself a stern talking to and go, read the slides, think about it, you know. But this is it. Even when you're aware of it, it's going to jump out and get you sometimes, but I think it's really important to try and be aware of it to a point where you can help yourselves. That's pretty much me for what I have to say. I'll, you can get me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not on Insta. I don't X. Uh, so, but I'll be about. Uh, I'm the guy in the yellow T-shirt. I'll be around in the hall at the gear set stand. If anybody's any questions later or questions now. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Round of applause. I think. Yeah. And. Uh, help you fight imposter syndrome, I think I can say you're the first speaker of the day who has actually finished on time, so well done. Oh. <laughs> we have five minutes for questions. Throw the hands up, please. Yay. Hi there. Um, I've experienced this so much in my career, and now, you know, I'm a senior, being very well paid, uh, mm -hmm. but like, supposedly operating at the highest level I've operated at, yep. and I have this every single day. Um, what, like... You, you recommended a whole bunch of things in your talk, hmm. but are there specific ways that we could, as seniors, be way more transparent and about sharing this, like systematic processes we could do? Or could we like create meetups? What other ideas do you have for being more transparent as seniors when this happens? It's a really good question. Um, we all love a bit of process. We're developers, we're like a, like a nice sort of system on reels of here's what you could do, here's your playbook. But I don't honestly know if there's like one, one way. Everybody's going to be different, you know? Um, but genuinely, actually just talking about it, you know? Because it's very likely other people in the room that you're working in having exactly the same issues and just going, listen, I don't understand this bit of the code base. Anybody else struggling with this? Yes, let's go and talk. I'm just talking it out, you know? Yeah. Very good. Uh, next one, show of hands. Oh, uh, yeah. um, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice for all this, what would it be? Hmm. I could go back in time and give myself one piece of advice. If I could go back in time to give myself one piece of advice, it would probably be enjoy your hair while you have it. But um, uh, I was going to say if there's one piece of advice, Dentistry, definitely dentistry. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's wear sunscreen, I don't know. Um, oh, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, I think it's probably the best piece of advice is you're not alone, you know. You look at the number of hands that were raised in this room, look at the number of senior people in this room that have said they're having the same problem. And it's just to uh, trust yourself, you know. Do the training, just keep practicing, you know. Come to, you know, Coming to events like this and learning stuff that's both related to what you do and outside of it, just that expansion of your your knowledge within the within the career as a whole is probably really useful, you know? Just keep learning, I guess, is probably the best piece of advice. Although not a piece of advice that I took very well, but yeah. Uh, last question, Hans, anybody? So this is the best I can come up with. Um, um, they say there's no such thing as a stupid question, um, but I'll try and give you one. If you're always like the person putting your hand up, asking the questions, and everyone else is keeping quiet, eventually would you sort of feel that maybe I should stop asking stupid questions or, or should maybe, it's this whole, Paranoia yeah. thing of imposter syndrome. So. This this one's kind of dear to my heart because right? I I always like asking questions and I've always tried to encourage myself and other people when I have is if you don't know something just ask. As a graduate, uh, I was on a graduate employment scheme uh, with a company in the UK 
And all the graduates got trolleyed around the head office and we had a series of presentations and a guy got up, a senior engineer got up to give a presentation and he trolleyed through his presentation and on one of the slides, there was a, an acronym which he pronounced and the acronym was ASFARP. Now, show of hands, anyone, any idea what ASFARP means? No, I don't have a clue either. But everyone else was sitting quietly and I put my hand up and went, excuse me, what's ASFARP mean? And everybody asked me, was like, oh yeah, yeah. So it's like, no, nobody, nobody knew, you know? As far as is reasonably practicable, just in case you're wondering, the world's most pointless acronym, but never be afraid to ask questions, you know? Genuinely, if you don't know and someone's trying to explain something to you, it's probably more a fault at the person trying to explain it than yours. And I can almost guarantee there's other people, even if they're not asking it, thinking the same question, who will appreciate you asking it, you know? If I could just chime in on that when I was doing booth duty at DevOx a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to a senior manager, and he said that the one developer they were most sorry to lose, uh, let, let's call her Jane, uh, uh, was because she volunteered for absolutely everything. You know, any task that came up, Jane raised her hand and volunteered for that task. Yeah, yeah. and said, so, and half the time she screwed it up totally, but that was brilliant. Yeah, because she j then generated the information and the knowledge that we needed. Yeah, for her to go away and with maybe a little bit of guidance and help do it right. And and uh, Kent Beck has this saying, which I love, which is that if you have no data in which to make a choice, do something that will generate data. <laughs> you know, so do, don't just stand there in paralysis, do something and that will give you data. And on that data, you then can perhaps make an informed choice. Yeah. So I would say never, ever stop putting your hand up, even if people aren't, you know, uh, explicitly saying it, that there is a lot of gratitude for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I nearly forgot. Garth was very keen for every speaker after the last one to get at least one Star Wars reference into their talk. Uh, and actually, uh, Star Wars is probably an ideal example of this. You know, Luke went off after his Jedi training without completing it because he was a bit afraid that he might never be as good as Yoda, you know? Keep working, that's what it's all about, yeah. Exactly right, and yeah. a perfect note in which to end. So yeah. another round of applause, I think. Thank you very much.